study the book of Micah. We are just beginning the book of Micah. And the title is Micah, Judgment Now, Blessings Later. And um, I found this a very interesting study this week. You know, there's, there's so much parallelism to end times yeah. and what we can learn from these ancient, you know, prophets and, and what, they, what they conveyed to the people at the time. But, you know, as Solomon says, there's nothing new under the sun. So <laughs> apostasy in ancient Israel kind of looks like apostasy does now. And um, God's word is, it never changes, right? So um, the blessings and the curses are still the same, and um, there's much for us to learn. So as we get into it this night, the fr uh, first thing I want to reference specif specifically more for the people who are viewing this online is that a lot of the content this evening came from a variety of references. So I'm using the King James Version of the Bible, the SDA Bible Commentary, um, a book that's titled Micah Judgment Now Blessings Later, that's by Mark Copeland, and A Guide to the Prophets by Stephen Winward, and um, a book entitled The Minor Prophets, an Exposition Commentary by J.M. Boyce. So in case you have an interest in, in looking those up. Um, so they're not my words, it's, you know, much, much of their work. Okay, so before we get into the study, let's have a word of prayer. Dear Father in heaven, I thank you that you have brought us together this, this evening as we open up the Sabbath hours. We pray that you will pour out your Holy Spirit and bless us abundantly as we study your word, as we glean from it the, the truths for not only ancient Israel, but the truths for us today. Help us to learn to understand and apply these truths to um, our own life. Lord, um, you, are, you are the sovereign world that has all the, all the worlds and all the lands um, within your hand and what you will do with one nation versus another you know that's up to you um, but the prophecies of the bible do tell us what is to come for us in the future so may we not take this message lightly lord um, because there is so much applicability here for the time we live in thank you lord for hearing our prayer in jesus name amen okay all right, so Micah. So um, I'm going to spend a few minutes at the beginning to give an introduction to the book of Micah. Uh, the next, uh, tonight and two more evenings, we'll cover the book of Micah. Tonight we're going to cover chapters one and two. But for an introduction. So the, the book is named after the prophet whose message it spares, which is Micah. And it is shortened from the form of the word Micaiah, which means who is like Yahweh. In the Hebrew, as in the English, the book stands six in the order of the minor prophets. In the Sept Septuagint, it stands third um, after Amos and Hosea, probably because of its size. Authorship. So Micah was called a Morshite a term applied to one who came probably from the village of Moresheth Gath, which is believed to be in the southern part of Judah, toward Philistia. He must not be confused with Micaiah, the son of Imlah, who prophesied in the days of Ahab, and you can read about that in 1 Kings 22. Nothing is known of the prophet except what is revealed in the book itself. So the fact that his father's name is not mentioned may suggest that he was a man of humble birth, and he was doubtless a Judean, as may be deduced from the fact that he mentions only the kings of Judah, and we'll read that, about that in Micah 1.1. He was the younger contemporary of Isaiah and of Hosea, both of whom began their ministry in the reign of Isaiah, the predecessor of Jotham, and you can read those, and we'll see them later in the study, Isaiah 1.1 and Hosea 1.1. Tradition says that he died peacefully in the place of his birth in the early part of Hezekiah's reign before the fall of Samaria. So Micah's language is poetic, rhythmical, and measured. His style might be taken to betray a peasant background inasmuch as it is rugged, simple, and forthright. The prophet is noted for his frequent use of figures of speech and his play on words. He is bold, stern, and uncompromising in dealing with sin, yet tender in heart. 
regretfully sorrowful in spirit and loving and sympathetic. So the historical setting. Micah, as did Isaiah, carried on his prophetic ministry in the critical period of the latter half of the 8th century BC, when Assyria was the dominant world power. The estimated timelines here for these prophets in, in the 8th century is uh, starting with Jonah, who prophesied in the city of Nineveh, that was around 790 BC. That continued with prophets sent primarily to the northern kingdom of Israel, um, Amos in 755 BC, followed by Hosea 750 to 25 BC, and then the southern kingdom of Judah was also the recipient of God's prophets. We have Isaiah 740 to 700 BC, and then Micah 735 to 700 BC. So you can see the overlap there. Um, and, you know, Isaiah and, and, and Micah were overlapping, but they were, they were in separate parts of the country. I, Isaiah was primarily in, in Jerusalem, and uh, Micah was in more the country land uh, of, of Judea. So in his own country, Jotham, the king of Judah, when he began his prophetic ministry, did that which was right in the sight of the Lord, although the people of his kingdom sacrificed and burned incense still in the high places. And that's found in 2 Kings 15. Ahaz, Jotham's son and successor, went the full length of idolatry, even burning his children in the fire after the abominations of the heathen. And you can read about that in 2 Chronicles 28. He did not hesitate to rearrange and change the brazen altar of burnt offering and the laver and to place within the sacred temple precincts an idolatrous altar which he saw at Damascus. So you can read that story in 2 Kings 16. These and other iniquitous acts against the true worship of the Lord made Ahaz probably the most idolatrous king who had reigned over Judah. So during the time of this spiritual declension among the inhabitants of Jerusalem and Judah, Micah exercised his prophetic office. The contents of his book set forth the moral and religious conditions among the people during the reigns mentioned. This idolatry was aggravated by the compromising attitude many took in observing outwardly the traditional forms of worship of the Lord while pursuing their idolatrous worship and practices. So that kind of like landed home to me as we start to read about how the rulers and, and the really elite um, viewed their life and their worldview versus what, what God's view is, right? Um, the priests of the Lord were in an apostate condition. They countenanced heathenism to retain their popularity with the people. And instead of defending the poor against the predatory rich, they themselves were possessed of a covetous spirit. There were many false prophets who curried the favor of the people by assuring them that good times lay ahead while scuffing at the threatened judgments that the true prophets of the Lord predicted would surely result from the nation's multiplying transgressions. These false prophets further lulled the people into a deadly spiritual sleep by calming their fears with the deceptive doctrine that because they are the descendants of Abraham, they were special people of God, and they could be certain that the Lord would never forsake them. The nobles and leading class had given themselves over to lives of luxury, and in their ardent desire for the good things of life, they became unscrupulous and cruel in their dealings with the peasants. Their greed ground down the poor by excessive exactions and deprived them of their legal rights. As occasionally and gratifyingly happens, a bad ruler is followed by a son who becomes a good ruler. Hezekiah, who succeeded Ahaz, was so, as devoted to God as his father had been devoted to idols. He trusted in the Lord God of Israel so that after him was none like him among all the kings of Judah, nor any that were before him. And that's uh, stated in 2 Kings 18.5. He resolutely set about to undo his father's apostasy, to reform the moral and spiritual conditions of Judah, to abolish idolatry and to bring his people back to the true worship of the Lord. In this, he was supported by Micah. 
the bitter struggle that the man of Morsheth Gath, which means the possession of Gath or a vineyard, had during much of his life to plant the seeds of truth upon the well-nigh sterile soil of his people's heart began to yield fruit. Reformation characterized the reign of Hezekiah. So as we re read through kind of the context of that historical background, do you see any parallels for what we see today in God's church? Yeah, absolutely. But compared to the Northern Kingdom, they had a few good kings, like Hezekiah yeah. and then yeah. before Ahaz, his predecessor. So there were some good kings. Yeah, absolutely. But what, what struck me was what it talked about the compromising attitudes of the priests, of the elite, you know, the church leaders, right, and, and the community leaders. And as, as the leader goes, so go the people, That's right, happening. often. That's mm -hmm. happening, absolutely. Yeah. And you see that in northern Israel, even though it was worse, the same mentality kind of occurred, though. So they had, because they always, when the king would ask for a prophecy, they always prophesied whatever the king wanted. Yes. Mm -hmm. Tell them what they want to hear. And in Judah, they were kind of learning to follow suit in the same way. Yeah, that's very true. Yeah. Okay, so theme. There's two main themes predominant in the book of Micah. Number one, the condemnation of the sins of the people and the consequent chastisement in captivity. And number two, the deliverance of Israel and the glory and gladness of the messianic kingdom. Throughout the book of Micah, threatening and promise, judgment and mercy alternate. The prophecies of Micah and Isaiah have much in common. Inasmuch as the two prophets were contemporaries and so had to deal with the same conditions and subjects, we can readily understand why their words and messages were so often similar. Though in the opening words of his book, Micah tells of what he saw concerning Samaria and Jerusalem, his prophecy deals more with Judah than with Israel. Though the ten tribes had cut themselves off from Judah and from Jerusalem, the center of the worship of the Lord, they were still God's people, and God was seeking to restore their allegiance to him. So how, how merciful and gracious is God, right? So I, I put the outline in here because, um, you know, it's a good reference as we go through the next couple of, of uh, weeks studying Micah. But in addition to that, I thought the outline was very interesting in that the beginning part of Micah, it talks about the national guilt and corruption, right? So you think about that in, in the great controversy context, it's talking about the sin of the world. Um, and, um, and, and specifically the sin within what should be God's tr true church or their followers. And then the second or the middle part talks about the messianic age and its blessing. So what is to come and how God will redeem his people out of that condition um, of, of, of guilt and corruption. And then the third part is the punishment for sin and hope in repentance. So again, to me, it just like covers the whole great controversy in this small book, but there's the whole spectrum is there. I, I found that very interesting. Okay, the city built with wrong. The book of Micah begins with a tale of two cities. God comes forth from the temple of heaven using the mountaintops as his stepping stones. He comes in judgment against the two Hebrew kingdoms. Israel and Judah, as represented by the two capitals, Samaria and Jerusalem. For from these cities, which should have been centers of law, order, and justice, instead moral corruption had spread like a contagious disease all over the land. Like Amos, Micah the countryman is appalled at the wickedness and the degradation, the selfishness and the violence, the enerviating luxury and the crass materialism of the inhabitants of the great cities. What is the transgression of Jacob? Is it not Samaria? And what is the sin of the house of Judah? Is it not Jerusalem? All these, all the leading citizens are implicated. Hating the good and loving the evil, the men of rank and influence have turned the moral order upside down. 
The rulers, the guardians of justice, have betrayed their trust. For they oppress the people, they govern, and, they, and then build the prosperity of Jerusalem to violence and injustice. The prophets are blind guides leading the people astray. Motivated by love of money, they bless the man who satisfies their material wants and declare war against him who puts nothing into their mouths. God will forsake them in the days that are coming. He will have no revelation to impart to such men. The judges cannot be trusted. For instead of administering justice impartially, according to ascertained facts and legal principles, their decisions are influenced by monetary bribes. The priests also have their price. They manipulate the sacred oracle and give instruction in accordance with the size of the fee. This mania for money is all the more odious because covered by, it's covered by a veneer of false piety. While professing to lean upon the Lord, the notable men are in fact worshipers of mammon. Upon them all, rulers, prophets, judges, and priests, Micah pronounces judgment. Therefore, because of you, Zion shall be plowed as a field, Jerusalem shall become a heap of ruins, and the mountains of the house a wooded height. Because of you, because of the corruption of the leaders, calamity will overtake Jerusalem, the temple site will be deserted, and the once populous city will become a heap of ruins. Such a prediction must have become had come at a profound shock to both the leaders and the people. They would regard such words as blasphemous. Because Jerusalem was a city of the great king, they believed it was invincible. The presence of God in the temple was a guarantee of the inviolability of Zion. Micah did not share this popular view, this complacent, comforting illusion. With magnificent courage, he announced the impending destruction of the city built with blood and with wrong. So in what ways do you think this de description parallels what we see today? What, what, and what we've seen for many centuries. Yeah, for sure. I mean, all of this Christ closers in many of the Christian churches today. Yeah. Yeah. And that is so sad because God's grace is free. Yeah, that's absolutely right. Yeah. Okay, so let's go in and read chapter, well, not quite yet. We're going to talk about chapter one, then we'll start reading it. Okay, chapter one, um, the national guilt and corruption, um, its heading is kind of Micah showeth the wrath of God against Jacob for idolatry, and he, and he exhorteth to mourning. So the first chapter has three main parts. The first one is the descent of the Lord in judgment. The second is the fall of Samaria. And the third is the effect of sin of Samaria on Jerusalem and a call for a proper response to this in infection. You know, just as we were talking about, you know, the, the ten tribes of Israel were often more corrupt Right, you know, every once in a while a good king would come in in Judea, but not so much in, in the northern kingdoms. But yet, Mike is pointing out here that that the influence of them corrupted Judah, right? And so um, that that's important too, because we we live in a world where we're surrounded by evils of all sorts, right? And so, what are we doing to preserve ourselves from that influence? Is is important thought. Um, okay, so in the first of these sections, Micah portrays the Lord as swooping down from heaven to do battle on earth. Micah's language describes precisely what the judgment will do, namely, sweep away everything before it. Notice the movement in verses 2 to 4. Micah begins with a picture of God in his holy temple, and from here he speaks against the people. Next, we see God coming from his dwelling place, in verse 3, and then he comes down the treads, the high places of the earth. At the touch of God's foot, the mountains melt beneath him and thus also accompany his descent. 
Micah imagines the valleys split apart to accommodate this new mass, which he says comes down like wax before the fire, like water rushing down a slope. This is intended to be terrifying, and it is. It is like the description the Romans gave of the Celtic warriors they encountered in their early conquests in Central Europe. To the Romans, the Celts were barbarians. In battle, they wore no clothes at all. They painted themselves with bright colors and they greased their hair so that it stood up fiercely from their heads as though they had been electrocuted. Before battle, they would, let, would be out of sight, and then suddenly they would come swooping down the hillsides, shrieking loudly in their unknown language, and fall upon the enemy ranks. It scared the Romans witless. So Micah paints a similar picture, only here it is not a mere horde of barbarians with whom we must deal. The attacking foe is God, the sovereign lord of the universe, and he is so angered at the wickedness he sees that he leaves his holy temple to do battle himself. All right. So will we not see that again in the end of time? Yeah. yeah. All right. So let's start reading Micah. Micah 1, 1 to 4. Does somebody want to read verses 1 to 4 for me, please? Okay. The word of the Lord that came to Micah the Morishite in the days of Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah, kings of Judah, which he saw concerning Samaria and Jerusalem. Hear, all ye people. Hearken, O earth, and all that therein is, and let the Lord God be witness against you, the Lord from his holy temple. For behold, the Lord cometh forth out of his place, and will come down and tread upon the high places of the earth. And the mountains shall be molten under him, and the valleys shall be cleft as wax before the fire, and as the waters that are poured down a steep place. Ooh. Okay, so you see that picture of the Lord sweeping down with like all that power and all that energy and it brings just, you know, a, a convulsion right on the earth. So um, and with your study guide here, you're going to see a couple colors. Yellow is pointing out the key points that I want to talk about. Green is the answer of it to below, so it correlates, so you're aware of that. Okay, so the, the word of the Lord, it says, that came to Micah. So the word there is the Hebrew word dabar, which is a stronger sense of commandment. So when the word of the Lord comes, it's not a, a recommendation. I, I hope you do this. It is a commandment, right? And, it, and it's um, actually the, in a, the equivalent word you can find in Deuteronomy 4.13 he declared unto you his covenant, which he commanded you to perform even the Ten Commandments. It's the same word. So when the Lord is speaking to Micah, it's a commandment. All right. <clears throat> the, the second part um, there then is, talks about Isaiah, um, Hosea, and Amos began to prophesy shortly before Micah during the reign of Isaiah, the father of Jotham, and, and you see the references there, Isaiah, Hosea, and Amos. So Isaiah 1.1 says, The vision of Isaiah, the son of Amos, which he saw concerning Judah and Jerusalem in the days of Isaiah, Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah, king of Judah. And then in Hosea 1.1, we see the word of the Lord that came unto Hosea, the son of Bere, in the days of Isaiah, Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah kings of Judah, and in the days of Jeroboam, and the son of Joash, king of Israel. And then Amos 1.1, 1, 1, the words of Amos, who was among the herdmen of Tekoa, when he saw concerning Israel in the days of Jeroboam, the son of Joash, Joash king of Israel, two years before the earthquake. Um, so you see these voices coming in different parts of the country, these prophets, but proclaiming the same thing. Anytime God is about to do something destructive like this, he brings a multitude of voices so nobody needs to be, you know, say, oh, I didn't hear anything about it. Like, he proclaims it, right? So we, we also saw this during um, the Reformation, right? We saw Wycliffe, we, Luther, and others. We also saw this, you know, in the late 1800s. We, we saw, you know, Miller and 
you know, Ellen White and others, right? So God has multiple people proclaiming so that we not, need not be confused that this is actually a message from him. And, and, and that's very interesting because um, you'll find that, you know, back in that day, you know, they don't have the internet like we have and whatever, and, you know, the message goes around in seconds around the world. You know, the fact that the same message was coming out of different places in the kingdom where there was, like, no communication going on, it was only a miracle of God. One looks at the Old Testament for a thousand years that proclamation was there. Yeah. For a thousand years. Yeah. And then Jesus comes. Yeah. Absolutely. 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 And don't we see that today? Yes. Don't we see, um, you know, an amplification of the three angels' message in the recent years? You know, um, so this is something for us to, to keep in mind. Um, so the, the other point that I highlighted there in verse 1 is kings of Judah. So the kings mentioned are those of Judah, doubtless because Micah's mission was particularly to the southern kingdom of Judah. However, like Amos, he also prophesied against the northern kingdom of Israel. Okay, in verse 2 then, um, it says, Hear all ye people. All ye people, the whole world is summoned to witness the divine judgments against Samaria and Jerusalem. In the fate of God's chosen people, men may read the fate of all nations who refuse to follow the divine blueprint. So oftentimes, these judgments against God's people are also a warning to those who are on the outside looking in and seeing what is happening um, to God's people. Um, and then it said there, um, the Lord will be a witness against you from his holy temple. So his holy temple, as we read in Habakkuk 2.20, says that, but the Lord is in his holy temple, let all the earth keep silence before him. So the, the Lord's holy temple is in heaven, right? That is the dwelling of the sovereign of the universe. It, it is the holiest of holy places. It's where God dwells. And so when, when God speaks from his holy temple, the mere inhabitants of the earth are to listen, right? Um, Prophets and Kings, page 364.3 says this, with unerring accuracy, the infinite one still keeps account with the nations. While his mercy is tendered with calls to repentance, this account remains open. But when the figures reach a certain amount, when God has fixed, the ministry of his wrath begins. The account is closed. Divine patience ceases and mercy no longer pleads in their behalf. Can you think of an example in, in history where that happened? Yes, absolutely. Sodom and Gomorrah. Even the northern Israel. Yeah. yeah ultimately, because they didn't have a remnant come back. That's right. That's right. You know, it's, it's uh, very interesting when we were studying Amos that uh, the Lord through Amos would say to the people, come to the temple, be with me, talk with me, come to the temple. Yeah. You know, the, the, the meaning of meeting God at the temple has always been very important to this day. Absolutely. Yeah, that's spot on. Um, okay, Daniel 4.17 says, This matter is by the decree of the watchers and the demand by the word of the holy ones to the intent that the living may know that the Most High ruleth in the kingdom of men and giveth it to whomsoever he will and settleth up over it the basest of men. Amen. All right. So that is still true today. Okay, verse 3. So it talks about the Lord cometh forth out of his place. We can read something about this in Isaiah 26, 21. It says, For behold, the Lord cometh out of his place to punish the inhabitants of the earth for their iniquity. The earth also shall disclose her blood and, no, and shall no more cover her slain. Okay. Um, and then it says that he treads upon the high places of the earth when he comes down. 
right? So that figuratively, um, God is represented as descending and walking on the tops of the mountains and the hills. And you probably read this in Amos 4.13. For lo, he that formeth the mountains and createth the wind and declareth unto man what is his thought, that maketh the morning darkness and treadeth upon the high places of the earth, the Lord, the God of hosts, is his name. Who else can do that? Right? Who else can tread upon the, the mountains and the hills and the tops of the earth, right? Um, interesting enough, too, the high places also represented where Israel practiced adultery with their idols. So an example is Leviticus 26.30. And I will destroy your high places and cut down your images and cast your carcasses upon the carcasses of your idols, and my soul shall abhor you, Right? So when the Lord comes down in judgment and he lands on the high places and the earth melts under him, you know, figuratively, and, you know, he, he is also able to then, you know, just completely decimate those adulterous places as well. Uh, verse 4, it said, um, the mountain shall be molten. So it says, the coming of the Lord is frequently represented as accompanied by a convulsion of nature. A, much, a most fearful upheaval in the physical world will precede the accompany the second coming of Christ. We read in Psalms 97.5, the hills melted like wax at the presence of the Lord and the presence of the Lord of the whole earth. And in the sixth seal of Revelation 6.14, we read, and the heaven departed as a scroll when it rolled together and every mountain and island were moved out of their place. Then in Revelation 16, 18, we read, and there were voices and thunders and lightnings and there was a great earthquake such as was not since men were upon the earth and so great. So does it sound like when the Lord visits the earth that something happens and people notice? Kind of sounds that way, doesn't it? Yeah. So the Great Controversy, page 636.2, says, It is at midnight that God manifests his power for the deliverance of his people. The sun appears shining in all its strength. Signs and wonders follow in quick succession. The wicked look with terror and amazement upon the scene, while the righteous behold with solemn joy the tokens of their deliverance. Everything in nature seems turned out of its course. The streams cease to flow. Dark, heavy clouds come up and clash against each other. And in the midst of the angry heavens is one clear space of indescribable glory. Whence comes the voice of God like the sound of many waters saying, it is done. That's pretty powerful, huh? That will be, uh, you know visible to everyone and as as she says it it will strike terror in the hearts of those who are not ready it really mm -hmm. comes to the point when the boils come either you have one or you don't and if you don't then you know at least you're with god and and you'll he'll carry you through that's right that's right you know that statement has a significant impact at least in my mind as far as god's patience and god's grace is Ellen White speaks of midnight. Yes. He couldn't wait anymore until yeah. the very last. Yeah. Midnight. Yeah. And, and what else do we know about midnight? Mm. Midnight's a very dark time, right? Dark time. Mm -hmm. so, so that's what we should expect. It's going it to be a very it's spiritually dark time exactly. when Christ comes, right? right? And, it, and he's going to come... And it is going to surprise many, um, not only those who are outside of the church, but it'll surprise many who think they are in the church, right? Yeah. Okay, so page seven then, judgment on Israel and Judah. Introducing the next section here. It says, the second part of this chapter concerns the fall of Samaria. Here pictured as a close future event, the city actually fell during the years of Micah's ministry. In this description, the downward moving imagery of the opening sections continues, for Micah sees the stones of Samaria's great fortifications tumbling down the ridge of Samaria into the valley. In the same way, all her idols will be broken into pieces and will fall. 
Amos denounced the kingdom of Israel for its sexual immorality, especially its cultic prostitution. You read about that in Amos 2, 7 to 8. This same theme emerges again in Micah. Since she gathered her gifts from the wage of prostitutes as a wage, wages of prostitutes, they will again be used, Micah 1, 7. So let's go ahead and read Micah 1, 5 to 9. Would someone like to read that, please? Sure. Verse 5. For the transgression of Jacob is all this, and for the sins of the house of Israel. What is the transgression, transgression of Jacob? Is it not Samaria? And what are the eye places of Judah? Are they not Jerusalem? Therefore I will make Samaria as an hip of the field, and as plantings of, of a vineyard. And I will pour down the stones thereof into the valley, and I will discover the foundations thereof. And all the graven images thereof shall be beaten to pieces, and all the hires thereof shall be burned with the fire, and all the idols thereof will I lay desolate, for the gathered, for she gathered it of the hire of an harlot, and they shall return to the hire of an harlot. Therefore I will wail and howl. I will go stripped and naked. I will make them willing a wailing like the dragons, and mourning as the howls. For her wounds is incurable, for it is come unto Judah. He is come unto the gate of my people, even to Jerusalem. Okay. Sad. Yeah, very sad, sad picture. All right, so in, in verse 5 to 7 there, we you know, have a few things to touch on. First of all, um, you know, in... In those verses, it's describing the punishment to come upon the northern kingdom of Israel for its sins. So as it said there, um, what is a transgression of Jacob? Is it not Samaria? Who do, who do we know that Jacob represents here? The, the actually, he actually represents both kingdoms, both the northern and, and the southern. Yeah. Now, uh, Hosea, Amos, and now Micah referred to Jacob significantly in relation to Israel yeah. to the ten tribes. Yeah. 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 Right. Because yeah. remember, oh, Go Jacob ahead. is a deceiver. That's our plan exactly right. Israel. Is yes. Right. Exactly. That's correct. That is yeah. correct. And yeah. you, you know, as, as we studied last week, those last uh, four, four chapters of Hosea, Jacob was prominent in being pictured to Israel as deceiver and repented of his sins. Yes, yes. And so this is a, a, a very important picture here. Yeah, it is. It's very important. And it makes a, he makes a distinction there, um, you know, talking about Jacob versus Judah. So Judah, you know, in the seat of Judah is Jerusalem, right? So at that time, they were much more faithful than the northern kingdom. Yeah. Here more tied to Samaria in their mind. Yeah, because so Samaria the was the capital of Samaria. Mm -hmm. Well, Ahab took Ahab when he was king king of of, uh, of Israel. He really erected a a um, Baal worship a Baal worship in Samaria. Yeah, he did. The, 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 the Judean kings did not do that in Jerusalem. That's right. And that's very different. That is very different. Yeah. And we're going to actually read some of that on page 8. So it says, Samaria, so as the capitals of Israel and Judah, respectively, Samaria and Jerusalem, had become the centers of idolatry and iniquity, Samaria had been built by wicked Omri and his son Ahab, who followed in his steps, erected in it a temple of Baal. That's in 1 Kings 16. Let's go ahead and refresh our memory on this, because this is important. Um, it shows how, how deep the apostasy of the northern kingdoms went, and the influence then that they had on um, Judah and Jerusalem. So 1 Kings 16, 23 to 33. Do I, do I have like a eager reader? Okay, go ahead. In the third, 
In the 30 and first year of Asa, king of Judah, began Omri to reign over Israel 12 years, six years reigning in Terzah. And he bought the hill Samaria of Shemer for two talents of silver and built on the hill and called the name of the city which he built after the name of Shemer, owner of the hill, Samaria. But Omri wrought evil in the eyes of the Lord and did worse than all that were before him. For he walked in all the ways of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, and in his sin, wherewith he made Israel to sin, to provoke the Lord God of Israel to anger with their vanities. Now the rest of the acts of Omri, which he did, and his might that he showed, are they not written in the book of the Chronicles of the Kings of Israel? So Omri slept with his fathers and was buried in Samaria, and Ahab, his son, reigned in his stead. And in the thirty and eighth year of Asa king of Judah began Ahab, the son of Omri, to reign over Israel. And Ahab, the son of Omri, reigned over Israel in Samaria twenty and two years. And Ahab, the son of Omri, did evil in the sight of the Lord above all that were before him. Amen. And it came to pass, as if it had been a light thing for him to walk in the sins of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, that he took to wife Jezebel, the daughter of Ethbal, king of the Zidonians, and went and served Baal and worshipped him. And he reared up an altar for Baal in the house of Baal, which he had built in Samaria. Right. And Ahab made a grove, and Ahab did more to provoke the Lord God of Israel to anger than all the kings of Israel that were before him. Right. Okay. Abject apostasy. Yep. And, and who do we know was a, a key prophet during that time? Elijah. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so the, the high places there, that Micah is referring to, um, references the heathen shrines and sanctuaries that are erected upon eminences where the inhabitants of Judah practice their idolatry. So you can, you know, we read about that in 1 Kings 16. You can also read that in 1 Kings 14. We'll read a few verses on that. It says, Hezekiah was the first of Judah's kings to thoroughly rid the land of these centers of idolatry. So... Like how many how many decades had that like settled in? Quite a few, yep. Yep. you know, a lot, a lot. Um, evidently, Micah's present prophecy preceded this reformation and was likely an inspiration for reform. <clears throat> so when you when you think about that, it's you know decades and decades, right? King after king, and they go deeper and deeper into apostasy. Like that's generation after generation of God's chosen people that are brought up in such a depth of apostasy that they don't even recognize who the real God is anymore or how to worship him, right? And that's what happened to that northern kingdom. Uh, 1 Kings 14, 22 to 24 says, And Judah did evil in the sight of the Lord, and they provoked him to jealousy with their sins, which they had committed above all that their fathers had done. For they also built them high places and images and groves on every high hill and under every green tree. And there were also sodomites in the land, and they did according to all the abominations of the nations which the Lord cast out before the children of Israel. So in verse Micah, in 1 verse 6, he had said, I will make Samaria a heap. So the future tense there indicates that the destruction of Samaria, which occurred in the sixth year of Hezekiah's reign, had not yet taken place. Right. And the heap there is uh, pronounced i.e., the Hebrew word i.e., is a heap of runes. Um, and then in, when it talked about in verse, just take a look back at your page there about... Um, Oh, I lost my page. Um, page, pa page seven is, is where you'll find your, um, your Micah text. Um, it says there, I will make Samaria as a heap of the field as plantings of a vineyard. Um, so then it says, for those plantings, Samaria is to be destroyed so completely that on its site, vines will grow, right? So there's not going to be anything left there to inhabit it. And then in verse um, 
6, it also says that he, I will pour down the stones thereof into the valley. Mm -hmm. So Samaria stood on a flat-topped hill with very steep sides. And 1 Kings 16 talks about that. And, the, and then God says, I will discover the foundations thereof, which literally is uncover or lay bare. What is he actually seeing here? Off the top. Right? Off the hill. So just as like the... Like it used to be before they built it. Exactly. Just as the walls of Jericho came down and nothing was left, this is going to be the, what, what happens here as well. Yep. Um, and then in... Verse 7, he says, And all the graven images, therefore, shall be beaten to pieces. Um, I'll give you an example from um, Josiah's Reformation, which is found in Second Chronicles 34, 3 and 4. It says, For in the eighth year of his reign, while he was yet young, he began to seek after the God of David his father. And in the twelfth year, he began to purge Judah and Jerusalem from the high places and the groves and the carved images and the molten images. And they break down the altars of Balaam in his presence and the images that were on high above them he cut down and the groves and the carved images and the molten images. And he break in pieces and made dust of them and strode it upon the graves of them that had sacrificed unto it. So, um, I'm, I'm trying, I'm, I'm thinking of, um, go ahead. So Josiah was actually one of the good kings in the south. He was. Kenya, and he was a few uh, kings before Hezekiah. Yeah, I do believe so. Yeah. Okay, um, and then in verse 7 again of, of Micah 1, it talks about the hire of a harlot. What does that mean? Yeah. So what, what were harlots being used for? For Really? Yeah. For the legitimate harlots or the rogue harlots? Because <laughs> <laughs> the legitimate harlots were the temple priests. And don't limit harlots to just women. There were men too. Yeah. Well, it says sodomy, right? That's what we just read. I mean, but yeah. literally, if, like for instance, at the Temple of Artemis, for instance, you could get a woman or you could get a guy. And so they had to draw the women in too. And yeah. so you, they were equal opportunity harlots. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, um, Okay, so, what, so that word hire comes from the Hebrew word ethnon, ethn, ethn, ethnon, a word frequently used in connection with the hire of a harlot. Prostitution was carried on in certain pagan temples as a part of worship of the goddess of fertility, and this was a practice that was forbidden by God. An example is found in Deuteronomy 23:18, when God says, Thou shalt not bring the hire of a whore, or the price of a dog into the house of the Lord thy God for any vow, for even though both these are abomination unto the Lord thy God. Okay, okay and then in verse 8 of Micah, it's, it says, I will wail and howl and go stripped and naked. So I will wail. That is for the doom to come upon Samaria, the coming of which would pose a threat to Judah's security as well. This is... This is um, Micah saying that, that he will wail and he will go stripped and naked. Uh, stripped is Hebrew shalal, which is barefooted, and naked is Hebrew ar aram, which is designating either complete nakedness or a half-clad condition. Here the latter meaning is indicated. Micah represents himself not only as a mourner who removes his outer garments, but also as a captive who is completely stripped of clothing and is carried off naked and despoiled. The act was to betoken humiliation, deprivation, and shame. Yeah. And then when he says he's going to howl like dragons in the morning of owls, dragons there is the Hebrew word tanim, which means jackals. So jackals and owls, or owls in this case is an, more of an ostrich, they have a doleful, piteous howl, right? Um, and then in verse 9, it says, For her wound is incurable, 
for it has come unto Judah. So this is where he's now transitioning to talk about the, the southern kingdom. Um, so incurable, Samar Samaria's day of grace was gone. Did we not read that the sovereign Lord gives a probationary period of time to nations and then at such time where they have apostatized so much, he, they meet their, their judgment? So that's what was happening here. Um, the nation had filled its cup of iniquity. The account was closed, and it was time for the ministry of divine wrath. How sad is that, huh? Um, and we read that in, in Prophets and Kings um, just a few minutes ago. And then it says, for now it's come on to Judah. So Judah, too, had been guilty and would receive its punishment. Okay. Let's go on and read Micah 1, 10 to 16. Someone would like to read that for me, 10 to 16? All right. Go ahead. No, go ahead. Okay. Declare ye it not at Gath, weep ye not at all. In the house of Aphra, roll thyself in the dust. Pass ye away, thou inhabitant of Sapphire, having thy shame, our shame naked, the inhabitants of Sa'anan came not forth in the morning of Beth, Bethelzum. He shall receive of you his standing. For the inhabitant of Moroth waited carefully for good, but evil came down from the Lord unto the gate of Jerusalem. O thou inhabitant of Lachish, blind or bind the chariot to the swift beast, she is the beginning of the sin of the daughter of Zion, for the transgressions of Israel were found in thee. Therefore shalt thou give presents to Morshagah. Um, the houses of Aksib shall be a lie to the kings of Israel. Yet will I bring un an heir unto thee, O inhabitant of Marashah, he shall come unto Adullam, the glory of Israel. Make thee bold, and pull thee for thy delicate children. Enlarge thy boldness as the eagle, for they are gone into captivity from thee. Okay. So remember when we started the introduction, we talked about how Micah uses a lot of like poetic imagery. So that's what's going on here. And so I want to read a little description of this from the commentary so that you can kind of understand it because in our in our modern language it gets lost on us but it says the third section begins with verse 8 and describes the passing of the evils of the northern kingdom to the south verse 9 is still speaking of samaria but already the transition is apparent her that is samaria's wound is incurable it has come to Judah. It has reached the very gate of my people, even to Jerusalem itself. The same thought appears in verse 12. Disaster has come from the Lord, even to the gate of Jerusalem. And in these verses, Micah is arguing that even as the sin of Samaria has spread to Jerusalem, so too the judgment befalling the northern kingdom will reach the southern one as well. In his dismay at what is coming, Micah looks over the Judean cities and reflects on the sinister destinies suggested by their names. These reflections are puns. To us, puns hardly seem serious, but this is not the way the ancient Jew would have taken them. A name handled in this way became an omen, for names were significant in any case, and a name suggesting disaster would have lingered over the city as a cloud, awaiting fulfillment. Fulfillment. Um, as Leslie Allen writes, names are treated as omens which, once observed, haunt the localities until they are fulfilled. They are revealed as clues to the curse that has come upon the country. So to give you some example here as we kind of look at the different cities that he lists off here, Ophrah, he says, roll in the dust. That is, they will cover themselves with dust in a traditional site of mourning. Sapphire is, sounds like the word for beautiful, but it will not be beautiful for long, said Micah. Instead, its citizens will be marched away naked and in shame, as will others of the southern kingdom. Zonan sounds like the Hebrew word for exit or go out, which is that word yatsa. 
But just like the beautiful city, which will not be beautiful, so this city will not go out to face its enemies. The citizens will be shut up inside their city like animals, and they will remain there until the city falls. Beth Ezel means the nearby city, but it will not be near in that day. It will be so taken up with its own mourning that it will be of no help to other cities. Maroth, the citizens of Maroth, or the word bitterness, will writhe in bitterness. Lachesh, a well-known military city about 30 miles southwest of Jerusalem, was and famous for its chariot horses. Micah says that in the day of judgment, these will be harnessed up, but the implication is that they will be harnessed to flee, not to fight. This important city was taken years later at the time of Sennacherib's, Sennacherib's Invasion. Thank you, Sennacherib's invasion. Sennacherib considered his conquest significant, for he used scenes from the city's encirclement and fall to decorate his great palace at Nineveh. And today, these reliefs are in the British Museum. And just a side note, that was the most fortified city in Judah. Yes. So that was an example. Jerusalem, you think you're going to stand? And just took down your number one guy. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Correct. Morasheth, Micah's hometown. It sounds like Morasheth or betrothed. So he speaks of giving the city wedding gifts as she passes from the rule of her own family to the authority of her cruel new husband, the invader. Agzib sounds like Agzab or deceitful, disappointing. Micah says she will prove deceptive to the kings of Israel. Marasha is related to the word Yoresh, or possessor, heir. She will be possessed by someone else. Adalam, verse 15, was a place of refuge to which David had gone during the dismal days when he was in flight from King Saul. And it will happen again, says Micah, for the aristocracy of Israel be forced to take refuge in this area. So if you were living in this region with these cities, like what would that feeling be as you were hearing this prophecy and understanding it from that lens? Knowing that this prophecy is coming from God, it's not like just something Mike is making up. You can take two routes. You can take the route of northern Israel, but they just missed it as, yeah, it's not going to happen. Yeah. You know, kind of like, the, oh, the Lord's been coming for how long now? Yeah. You know, kind of thing? Yeah. Or you could take it as a, maybe I need to straighten up or perhaps get a place in the country. Get yeah. out of here. Yeah. But, and, and, and there is a third element to that. Mm -hmm. and, uh, we, we are facing the third element often. And the third element is, well, I've heard that before. Yeah, exactly. Does it really affect me? Yeah. Maybe not. Yeah. And that's the sad part. That is the sad part. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah, that's, that's something for all of us to, to remember, too. Um, because, you know, at, in these last days where we're at, what does the Lord call the last day church? Laodicea, right? And what is Laodicea? Yeah. It's a sleepy church, right? Uh, right? Uh, so we're not, we're not much different um, as a church. Uh, so <clears throat> verse 10, then, let's go ahead and look a little deeper on some of these texts. Um, it said, declare ye. So in verses 10 to 16, that constitutes a dirge over the judgment to fall upon Judah. The opening clause is taken from David's dirge over Saul, which is found in 2 Samuel 1.20. And it says, tell it not in Gath, publish it not in the streets of Ascalon, lest the daughters of the Philistines rejoice, lest the daughters of the uncircumcised triumph. So Gath was one of the five chief cities of the Philistines. The ruin of Judah was not to be proclaimed in this enemy center. In Hebrew, the word for Gath approximates in sound the word for declare. Many scholars believe there is here an intended play on words that may be reproduced as follow. Tell it not in tell town. Such plays on words are common in Hebrew poetry. Right, and then each one of these has that kind of pun that added to it. House of Afraf is roll thyself in dust, more fully transliterated, Bethly of Arafraf, perhaps et Taiabe near Hebron, 
Afroth is from a Hebrew root meaning dust. Scholars have suggested another play on words which may be reproduced as follows, roll in the dust in dust town. Verse 13 talks about um, Lachish, the, um, the chariot one, and it says, if she is the beginning of sin to the daughter of Zion. Mm -hmm. So it is not revealed how Lachish became the beginning of Judah's sin, but Lachish was a fortress city of Judah, about 27 miles southwest of Jerusalem. The city fell to Sennacherib at the time of his invasion right. of Judah during Hezekiah's reign. God told the Israelites not to have chariots. Yes, he did. One of the, and Solomon is kind of the first one to break that. Yes. But their strength was supposed to lie in God and not their own. That's right. right. And, and, and what, from what country did their chariots and the horses originally come? Yes. yes. So basically they go back to their place of bondage and bring these things that God says you shall not have. Yeah. So... Um, we can we can about imagine what kind of sin was going on there. If it then you know just 27 you know kilometers is not that big of a dif difference distance, right? And so you know in short it had an influence there. Uh, verse 14 says, "You shall give presents to Morsheth Gath." So that presence word is called shilakum or sending away gifts, and it's as a dowry to a daughter when she is married. The passage may mean that Judah is to surrender the possession of Morsheth Gath. Akzib, um, Hebrew word uh, there, Akzib, a town is believed to have been in Shepla, or the lowland of Judah near Adullam. The word translated lie is Akzab. There is here also a striking play on words. The houses of Akzib, or lie town, shall be Akzab, a lie. Yeah. Uh, verse 15, yet I will bring an heir so, um, to Mirasheth. So because it is similar in sound to the Hebrew Morashah, a word meaning inheritance, there is probably another play on words, yet will I bring an inheritor who will claim your heritage town. So in other words, you're going to lose your heritage town yep. to someone else. Yeah. Um, number 16, um, make thee bald and pull thee. So make thee bald is a symbol of mourning. You read that in Amos 8.10. Jerusalem is called upon to mourn for her children who are taken away into exile. Pull is a Hebrew word gazaz, or to cut the hair. The clause is parallel with make thee bald. And then it says baldness as an eagle Eagle there, Hebrew nesher, which is used to designate both an eagle and a vulture. Here, a bald-headed vulture is probably intended. Okay, so it, it you know, again, it's just like winter, winter people made bald and cut their hair and all that. You know, it's when they go into captivity. And remember, when Sennacherib invaded Judah, he actually, the cities that did fall, they were all carted off to slavery. That's correct. Yes. So anybody That's that, right. all these cities, if they did fall, Jerusalem was the only one that was saved <laughs> yeah. by God in some of the surrounding areas. But the rest of those cities went into, you know, slavery. And the Assyrian Empire was around for a while after that. Yeah. Until well, Nebuchadnezzar's father, I forgot his name, but um, actually rebelled and, and mm -hmm. conquered Assyria. Yeah. That's right. And the same That's happened to Assyria when Assyria conquered the northern kingdoms, exactly the same. Right. Yep. They took them all out. Yep. But yep. Is that in Bonin? I think or something like that. No, the plaza or something like that. No, the plaza or something. Yeah. But um, that was at least because when Sennacherib was killed by his sons, yes. that was at least 10 or 20 years after the, the defeat at Jerusalem. Yep. Yes. So, yes. And then they still yes. had other rulers after that. So it was a while. Yeah. yeah. It was. Yeah. Okay, so it says the chapter closes with an appeal to Jerusalem as a father or mother of the outlined villages, which were her children. The people of Jerusalem are to shave their heads in mourning, for the ch children in whom they delight are to be taken away into exile. Or King James Version says captivity. Exile, this is a climax of the chapter. For although Micah has been moving his readers in this direction, he's nevertheless not used the word until now. 
Now that he does, nothing should be more dreaded or more severe. To go into exile was to become a slave, and to have an entire people exiled was the death of a nation. So this is a pretty, pretty, pretty dark prophecy in 16 verses, right? Yeah. It is interesting, as we actually study the, the minor prophets, that uh, we really begin with, uh, with, with prophet, prophet uh, Joel uh, beginning to say, come on guys, wake up to the reality. You're wrong. Then Hosea comes in, and Hosea really makes a, a, a spectacle of, of the sins that there exist. And now you've got Micah saying, it's happening. And when we were doing the initial breakdown of when the, each of the prophets mm -hmm. lived, well, Hosea was somehow overlapping in the yeah. time with right. Micah. Yeah, he was. Yeah. So, um, to close it out in, in that first chapter, it says, Micah reveals to wide-eyed hearers, aghast and ready to hear the worst, that behind the grim future stands the person of Yahweh. No longer a safe stronghold, but his en people's enemy. Micah whips up his hearer's emotions and pushes them into inconsolable grief in order to dispel their complacency and arouse in them a sense of their own sin and liability to punishment. So, um, I mean, isn't that what it is today? When you think about the end of time, the one that's going to bring the pu punishment for those who don't accept him is, is going to be the sovereign Lord, right? right? And that's, that's the really sad part. And we do know, too, that this is, the Bible calls this, this is God's strange act. He has no delight in, in um, taking down nations and decimating cities. Um, he wants everyone to be saved. Um, but, you know, per the, for the, you know, we, we are at war, and that's something we always have to remember, is, is this earth is at war, and there's this great controversy going on. And um, sometimes people's, the peoples and nations, their time has just come to an end. And for the mercy of those who believe in God or yet to believe in God, God allows them to be destroyed. Go ahead. It's just the patience of God. Though. Yeah. I mean, you look when um, Abraham, when he said, oh, this will be your inheritance, but not now the, the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet complete. Well, that's at least 400 plus more years. Yeah. Or you look at Israel, their um, idolatry started in the wilderness in that 40 years. And God went, what was it, seven, 800 years with yeah. that at least before um, he said, okay, enough. Yeah. yeah. So it's not like he doesn't give an opportunity or two or no. 8,700. Yeah, absolutely. Well, he gave them 490 years of probation because when, wasn't it Peter asked, should we forgive seven times? And Jesus said 70 times seven, mm -hmm. yeah, which was yeah. significant of the 490 years of probation that God gave them. Yeah. You, 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 you know, at least I don't want to, uh, but I, I want to share this. For me personally, this has touched my heart so significantly. And this is how God, God is so, so upset and so in love with Israel that calls Israel Ephraim. Yeah. And when we look at Ephraim, and, uh, and we, we really go to the theologies of why is that Ephraim, and the theologians say, well, because that was the biggest of the ten tribes, uh, there is something a lot more than that. Ephraim was the son of Joseph. Yes. Joseph was the, the prized son of Jacob. Yeah. And uh, here's he he, he is the Lord really saying to Israel, you are my grandson. Yes. If there is any love that I have, I have a love that is really for you. Yeah, yeah. And it, it is remarkable yeah. uh, how, how we see this compassion, this appeal, yeah. and yet we see God's people totally oblivious. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, what does the Lord say about Ephraim? He says, leave him alone. He's tied to his idols. Right. right? Can you imagine when, when Joseph is resurrected and he, he sees where his heritage went, right? Um, so many of the people in his own, uh, his own line were, were lost right. and, and that God had to give them whole up as a, 
that part of the nation, how sad that will be for him. Yeah, for sure. Okay, so let's go on to chapter 2. We're going to try to, like, do chapter 2 in 45 minutes. <laughs> All right, I think we can do it. Okay, woe to evildoers. Uh, Micah 2, 1 through 5. Would someone like to read that, please? Woe to them that devise iniquity and work evil upon their beds. When the morning is light, they practice it because it is in the power of their hand. And they cut up fields, and they take them by violence in houses, and take them away, so that they oppress a man in his house, even a man in his heritage. Therefore, thus saith the Lord, Behold, against this family do I devise an evil, from which ye shall not remove your necks, neither shall you go haughtily, for this time is evil. In that day shall one take up a parable against you, and lament with a doleful lamentation, and say, We be utterly spoiled. He has changed the portion of my people. How hath he removed it from me? Turning away, he hath divided our fields. Therefore, thou shalt have none that shall cast a cord by lot in the congregation mm. of the Lord. Mm. Yeah. So this is what we find as we begin the second chapter of Micah. The rich of his day were working dishonestly to increase their wealth. And in itself, there is nothing wrong with prosperity. In fact, it's a blessing from God. But these people were increasing their wealth through force and fraud. They were not even able to wait until the daybreak to form their evil stratagems. They lay awake plotting and then when the daylight came, they immediately rushed out to put their plans into effect. Micah says that they had forgotten that God had plans too, and that his plans rather than theirs would prevail. They plan iniquity, he writes, but God says, I am planning disaster against this people from which you cannot save yourselves. Amen. All right, so verse 1 there says, Woe to them. So Micah condemns the injustice toward the oppression of the poor. And he talks there about they work evil upon their beds. So that is at nighttime they devise the plans they hope to execute the following day. You can read about that in um, Psalms 36.4. So intent were these evildoers upon accomplishing their purpose that as soon as the morning became light, they carried it out. Psalms 36.4 says, He devises mischief upon his bed. He setteth himself in a way that is not good. He abhorreth not evil. All right. And so then it says, um, it says they do this because it's in the power of their hand. What do you think that means? Yeah, they were able to. They were the elite ones that had the power, right? This is in northern Israel, right? So... No, this is talking about southern Israel. This is talking about Judah. This is now Israel. Yeah. So um, I was just saying, even in, in northern Israel, they couldn't get justice over a pair of sandals. That's, that's, exactly. that's right. A couple of bucks. That's, that's exactly. right. That's exactly. So the poor couldn't even get justice over a couple of dollars. Yeah. Well, that's really powerless. Yeah, I mean, they are powerless. This happening to our time. It is. It is. We're seeing it happen again. Quite a couple of dollars, but if I have money and the right attorney and the right vision of my truth that yeah. I portray, yeah. don't people walk all the yeah. time with that? Also, in the Northern Kingdom, didn't Jezebel have her king, the king Ahab, kill someone to yeah. get their piece of land to have a vineyard? That's right. It's like, well, I want that land. Actually, we'll go kill it. I just want that. Actually, she got two yeah. people to lie, saying he blasphemed, yeah. so they would kill him. Yeah. Yeah. This is the height of idolatry. Yeah. It is. Period. It is. It's greed and it's yeah. selfishness. And I'm, in, I'm in control of yes. my destiny. That's right. Also, coveting. Mm -hmm. yeah. Or it's worse than that. Yeah. Worse. Okay, so it says um, they operated on the wicked principle that might makes gain. When men take advantage of their power, they are almost certain to abuse it. The word here, translated power, is El. It's a word frequently translated God. 
However, in this idiomatic expression, it seems clearly to have the meaning power or mighty one, mighty men. For other occurrences of the idiom, see, you know, I gave you some references, Genesis, Deuteronomy, Nehemiah, and Proverbs. Let's read Genesis 31, 29. This is uh, Laban speaking to Jacob. It is in the power of my hand to do you hurt. But the God of your father spake unto me yesternight, saying, Take thou heed that thou speak not to Jacob, either good or bad. Right? Okay. And certainly that, that does happen today, and we see more of it um, happening in this country, unfortunately. Uh, verse 2 there says, They covet their fields and take them by violence. So covet the fields. It says, um, so grasping and rapacious were they for earthly possessions that their covetous designs were executed through violence. There's a number of references I leave you there. It says, anciently, land sold was to revert to the original owner in the year of the Jubilee. Mm -hmm. Estates were not to be transferred from tribe to tribe. So what, is, what do you think God thinks about them stealing the land of someone else? What's interesting is their heritage. Yeah. yeah. Even from their you know, grandchildren. That's right. Jubilee was to let people remind people that who was the real owner of the land. That's, That's so right. That was God. That is so correct. they're not stealing from people, they're stealing from God. That is right. You're you're right. And that's why he calls it the covet fields. Where do you find the word thou shalt not covet? In the commandments. In the, in the commandments, right? Yeah. Thing right now, what we have is not ours. We have no right to, you know, to, you know, I'm talking to myself. To be good stewards. We have to be good stewards. Yeah, I think God wants us to be a good steward. Yeah. Okay, so Leviticus 25, 10 to 28 says, And ye shall hallow the fiftieth year and proclaim liberty throughout all the land unto all the inhabitants that Okay, is that good? All right. Um, so in, in uh, talking about this evil, Micah uses a very important word, covet. It comes from the last of the Ten Commandments in which God says, you shall not covet your neighbor's house. You should not covet your neighbor's wife or his manservant or maidservant, his ox or his donkey or anything that belongs to your neighbor. Micah accuses the people of breaking this Tenth Commandment. Their covetousness has led them into the plotting and violence they are blamed for. Okay, verse 3 there, it says, Against this family I do, do I devise an evil. So do I devise, it says, Sin had brought about a disregard for family relationships. God would bring judgment against this family of the whole nation as they devised iniquity, so God would devise an evil. And then it says, you shall not remove your necks. Um, their chastisement would be as heavy and a galling a yoke that they would not be able to throw it off. And then it, he, the Lord says, neither shall you go haughtily, for the time is evil. So go, go haughtily is that is which lifted with uplifted head. The pride of the oppressors would be humbled. And then the time of evil, it says, or will be evil. The prophet is speaking of the future judgment God will bring upon his people. All right, verse 4. Um, it says, in the day that one will take up a parable against you. So that Hebrew word, mashal, here probably is a sense of a taunting song. In that day, the evil time mentioned in the preceding verse the enemy shall employ the words Israel used to lament her calamity as a taunt against her. An example of that is in Habakkuk 2.6. Mockingly representing themselves as the afflicted Jews, the enemy bewail the fact that Israel 
once prosperous, is now utterly, un, utterly spoiled, reduced to ruin and desolation, and that their inheritance, the portion of my people, is now changed and removed. In other words, the land of Canaan that God promised to the descendants of Abraham would be transferred to their enemies. No mockery hurts and stings more than the repetition in jest by another of words used to bemoan oneself. Um, and then the last part of verse 4 there, it says, turning away, he hath divided our fields. So that turning away, the Hebrew root is shobeb, a back turning or an apostate. Among our captors, he divides our fields. And then in verse 5, he had um, closed with, therefore thou shalt have none that shall cast a cord. So cast a cord there, Micah informs the oppressor that because he has dealt unjustly with his neighbor's land, he will have no more an inheritance in Israel. The cord was a measuring line used to divide land. Um, the reference you can you see there, Amos 7.17, thy land shall be divided by line. Okay. All right. Okay, so let's go on and read Micah 2, 6 through 11. Do I have a reader? Okay, go ahead, Daniel. Prophesy ye not, say they to them that prophesy. They shall not prophesy to them that they shall not take shame. O thou, thou that art named the house of Jacob, is the spirit of the Lord strained? Are these his doings? Do not my words do good to him that walketh uprightly? Even of late, my people is risen up as an enemy. You pull off the robe of the garment from them that pass by securely as men averse from war. The, the women of my people have ye cast out from their pleasant houses. From their children have ye taken away my glory forever. Arise ye and depart, for this is not your rest. Because it is polluted, it shall destroy you, even with a sore destruction. If a man walking in the spirit and falsehood do lie, saying, I will prophesy unto thee of wine and of strong drink. He shall even be the prophet of this people. And yeah. Yep. Okay. So verse 6 there, prophesy ye not. So the meaning of this verse is obscure, and many interpretations have been offered. But the verse reads literally, prophesy ye not, they prophesy. Do not prophesy concerning these things. Insults shall not turn back. The words seem to be a protest on the part of those rebuked by Micah. So they didn't want to hear these words, right? They want to, they want to listen to the smooth talking of the false prophets, right? So it is likely, as we see elsewhere in the Bible, that the oppressors sought out other prophets that would contradict Micah and tell them what they wanted to hear. So an example, Isaiah... Uh, was that with... King Ahab, when he went out to war. That's, that's correct, in Samaria. Yeah. Right. The head, the head of Micah. The head of Micah. Yeah. 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 It was the guy that began with an M that you compared him to and said it wasn't him. That's um, exactly. But I'm similar to Micah. Yes. And then a Ahab says, I don't like that guy. He always tells me bad news. Yes. 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 That's, that's right. right. Uh, that's right. Uh, and he, he procured an edit to get him out of uh, out of the Lord. That's right. And Ahab did not do that. That's right. And then he goes to uh, to to Hosea and says to Hosea, "Disappear. Yeah. We don't want you." That's right. That's right. Micaiah. Micaiah. That's it. Yeah. Yeah. I thought it's Elijah that he didn't like. No, no, Micaiah. Oh, he didn't like Elijah. Yeah, he. Of his people. Yeah. yeah. But I think Elijah was earlier on. He'd already been taken to heaven by like this time. Yes, oh. no, that's correct. But that's just funny. Tell me what I want to hear. Don't give me that guy who tells me the truth. <laughs> yeah. It's not what politicians do today. They just tell people yeah. what they want to well, hear. Well, for sure. It's not just politicians. Well, until they get yeah. elected. We don't yeah. like it when, yeah. we are, when we are rebuilt. When we view even by the That's true. Time. We, we like to hear the smooth scenes. We like to hear on great well, our ears tickle. And how things are going to just work out just fine. And, uh, and I think there was another example of that the cousin of Moses, Korah. Mm -hmm. I think he flattered the people of Israel, and that's how he was trying to get the people to rebel against Moses. He's mm -hmm. like, you are really a good people, but Moses is too harsh on you. Mm -hmm. So why don't you oh, have yeah. me as your...
your leader and I, I'll That's be right. more encouraging. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That hurts all of you. All right, yeah. Isaiah talked about this as well, Isaiah 30, 10. It says, which say to the seers, see not, and to the prophets, prophesy not unto us right things. Speak unto us smooth things. Prophesy deceits, right? So. Yeah. All right, verse 7, it says, O thou that art named the house of Jacob. So thou that art named that the Hebrew amur from the root amar to speak, hence something spoken or someone called. Since the Hebrew has an interrogative prefix, the clause may be translated, should this be said, O house of Jacob. So Micah chides the speakers for expressing thoughts foreign to the Spirit of God. So because they were wanting smooth sayings and false things that say, hey, you're going to be okay, he's rebuking them for that. Um, and then it says, is the Spirit of the Lord straightened? So that word literally is shortened. Used in connection with spirit, the word signifies uh, to be or to become impatient. Here the prophet chides those who accuse the Lord of being impatient because he gives way to threatening his people. This is not so, for God has ever been long-suffering in his dealings with Israel. However, when men sin, they must expect to reap the results of their evil doing. Um, we can read an example of this in Exodus 34, 6, and 7, which says, And the Lord passed by before him and proclaimed, the Lord, the Lord God, merciful and gracious, long-suffering and abundant in goodness and truth, keeping mercy for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin, and that will by no means clear the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children and upon the children's children unto the third and to the fourth generation. Amen. So this is the character of God. He, he is long-suffering and merciful, you know, far beyond our, uh, what we can imagine. But there, there is an end to that mercy. Um, and when, when, when people or nations come to a point where they just no longer want God and they are no longer redeemable, remember we read in Micah 1, Samaria is incurable. So God had done everything to cure Samaria, but it became to a point where they had apostatized so much that they were incurable and then God sent the destruction. Uh, the Old Testament stories seem to have a New Testament type, so mm -hmm. I think the the anti-type of this would this be Laodicea. Mm -hmm. So Laodicea yeah. wants smooth things prophesied to them. They don't want to hear anything harsh. Mm -hmm. And it sounds like the people of that time were sort of in that mindset. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And actually, it's 2 Timothy 4.3. Uh -huh. For the time will come when they shall not endure sound doctrine, but wanting to mm -hmm. have their ears tickled. Yes. For they will accumulate for themselves teachers in accordance with their own desires. Yeah. Aren't we there? We are here. Yeah, that we, at least that we are here. Yeah. And it's not just in, because it's easier for us to say, oh, it's, you know, in other churches, other Christian churches, where, you know, it's, it's in the Adventist church, too. Yes. There are, there are plenty of Adventist church which will not listen to sound doctrine anymore. Yeah. It's probably, it's probably worse. We are, because we well, know better. You're right. We know better. But yeah. here's the thing. Are we making our church, you know, God uh, fit to our boxes, you know? It's right. Like Israel. Right. Like that. I want it to be like this. I want the pastors like this. Right. I want this. It's right. not true that God's a word. Uh, I mean, word God's word. word yeah. God. yeah, that's right. God wants God wants us to come up to His level, not for us to try to fit exactly. Him into our boxes. So. Well, and then I think a lot of churches are doing similar things to what Israel was doing. So they prophesy for money. In other words, they will only speak things that will draw people in and increase their donations. So. They, they care more about their financial well-being than about speaking the truth. Yeah. So if the truth is going to drive away listeners, which is going to reduce mm -hmm. their revenues, they may not speak. They'll only, they'll only speak parts of the truth that will draw people in. Yeah. Scott, yeah. Lear just cost a lot of money. <laughs> you know, I think people will rise up, though. I do. I, I was infusing a woman the other day, and I was telling, telling you about today um, and I'm trying to think about how we got on the conversation I shared with her 
about helping a homeless man, mm -hmm. and, and I had put him in a hotel, and I had bought him some clothes, and I got him to the Salvation Army, mm -hmm. and I was trying to get him rehab. And she said, you know, it's so interesting because you were sitting here taking my line out, her big line. And she said, I was sending a prayer silently up to God on whether I should talk to you about this ministry my husband and I are starting. Now we're seeing this huge $2 million house that they just redid that has this whole view of the whole harbor and everything, right? And she says, she says, my husband and I have been so frustrated that the churches are not doing enough to help the homeless that we're going to start this new ministry where we invite people to put together money to help the homeless and genuinely help the homeless. And she says, and I mean like help the homeless in a way like you were saying that it, you couldn't get Thomas into a, a alcohol rehab because he didn't have an ID. And she said, people who could help with that. And I was just dumbfounded. I said to her, that's, that's so incredible. I said, I'm going to put you together with Armand Modielli. You know, and then I called mm -hmm. Armand. I said, you've got to talk to this woman. I said, when I met her, you know, I, I, I met her at her door and said, you're so familiar to me. Are you friends with so-and-so? She's like, well, are you friends with so-and-so? It was like we had known each other. Mm -hmm. And we may know some people in town the mm -hmm. same, but it, we had this familiarity feeling, mm -hmm. she and her husband and me. It was just so interesting. And it has to do with God. And I, mm -hmm. I told Armand, I said, you know, these are Sunday worshiping people, but their heart is to help the yeah. homeless yeah. right now. Yeah. And so there will I think there will be people that rise up. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. They're gonna They're rise up from very God places. has his remnant in all places. Right. Yeah. It's just amazing that happened. That's right. Absolutely. Thanks for sharing that. Okay, so um he says he will no, no, by no ways clear the guilty. It says, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon children and upon the children's children. Oh, you read that one. Okay. So um, his doings. Are these not his doings? So these chastisements and judgments do not come because God would have it so. I left you some references there. He is a God of love and delights in mercy. Punishment is to him a strange work, a strange act, for it is foreign to his nature. Um, and I left you some, some text there for you to go read. Um, Micah affirms that our chastisements are our own doing, not God's. The sinner is in this sense his own punisher. As the son cannot be held responsible for the shadow cast by an opaque object, so God cannot be held responsible for the sinner's iniquity. So James 1, 13 to 15 says, Let no man say when he is tempted, I am tempted of God. For God cannot be tempted with evil, neither tempteth he any man. But every man is tempted, and when he is drawn away of his own lust and enticed, then when lust hath conceived, it brings forth sin, and sin when it is finished brings forth death. So the Great Controversy, page 36.1, says, We cannot know how much we owe to Christ for the peace and protection which we enjoy. It is the restraining power of God that prevents mankind from passing fully under the control of Satan. The disobedient and unthankful have great reason for gratitude for God's mercy and long-suffering in holding in check the cruel, malignant power of the evil one. But when men pass the limits of divine forbearance, that restraint is removed. God does not stand toward the sinner as an executioner of the sentence against transgression, but he leaves the rejectors of his mercy to themselves to reap that which they had sown. Every ray of light rejected, every warning despised or unheeded, every passion indulged, every transgression of the law of God is a seed sown and it yields its unfailing for harvest. The spirit of God persistently resisted is at last withdrawn from the sinner, and then there no left, is left no power to control the evil passions of the soul and no protection from the malice and enmity of Satan. The destruction of Jerusalem is a fearful and solemn warning to all who are trifling with the offers of divine grace and resisting the pleadings of divine mercy. 
Never was there given a more decisive testimony of God's hatred of sin and to the certain punishment that will fall upon the guilty. Words of wisdom. Yeah, that's right. That's right. And it's just as, you know, a persistence in doing wrong leads to sin and ultimately death, a persistence in doing right, God works with to, to put his character in you and sanctify you, right? Amen. Um, habits are important. They can either lead to death or they can lead to life, right? And even the New Testament, they call that when you continually put God off till it leads you to your own device, that's the unpardonable sin, grieving the Holy Spirit. Yeah. Also, it says that the character is that the one we bring to heaven. Mm -hmm. That's right. So that's the only thing we bring. Yeah. We have to build it here for heaven. That's right. Oh, that's right. Okay, verse 8 there says, my people have risen up as an enemy. So an accusation against those of the upper class who treat the common people as an enemy by robbery and plunder. Though they were apostate and sinful, God out of his abiding love still calls Israel my people. Mm -hmm. um, and it says, ye pull off the robe with the garment. So a robe, the Hebrew salma, the outer mantle, was used also for the covering the body during the sleep. The creditor was not permitted to keep the salma from the debtor during the night. You remember that in Exodus 22. It says, If thou at all take thy neighbor's raiment to pledge, thou shalt deliver it unto him by the, that the sun goeth down. For that is his covering only, it is his raiment for his skin, wherein shall he sleep? And it shall come to pass when he crieth unto me that I will hear, for I am gracious. And then it says, um, going back to verse 8, it says, um, they will pass by securely as men averse from war. So that says, those of the upper class seize these garments from the peaceful common people. Right? So you, could, you see this just robbery, blatant robbery going out because it says the power is in my hand to do it. Right? Hey, they, instead of being able to sleep in like a sleeping bag or something like yeah. that, something can do that, you're left out in your underwear. Yeah, yep. that's right. That's right. Yeah, that's exactly it. Okay, so verse 9 said, The women of my people have ye cast out. So the women probably are the widows who should have been defended. Yep. And cast out, or Hebrew garage, conveys the meaning of forcible expulsion. And uh, he says, you've taken away my glory forever. So the meaning there is that children would be stripped out of their blessings, probably through want and ignorance, or being sold into slavery and so deprived of their God-given freedom. Verse 10, um, we, had wrote, we had read, arise ye and depart, for this is not your rest. So depart, uh, says, the oppressors are to be expelled from their land, even as they had banished others. And when it says, this is not your rest, it says, that is the land of Canaan. Remember, God said, I'm going to bring you into the promised land, the land of rest. So um, in Deuteronomy 12, 9, it says, for ye are not as yet come to the rest and to the inheritance which the Lord your God had given you. But it, why does it say in verse 10, it's not your rest? It's not your rest because it's polluted and it's going to destroy you. So because of their iniquities, the land had become polluted. So therefore, although they were living in the land of their heritage, it was not their rest because it was no longer under the influence of God like he had intended. And so therefore, all this iniquity was polluting the land and it was, it was, it was like it had gone back to the Canaanites. So Leviticus 18, 25, and 27 said that the land is defiled, therefore I do visit the iniquity therefore upon it, and the land vomiteth out her inhabitants. For all these abominations have the men of the land done, which were before you, and the land is defiled. Um, you're going to say something, yeah, Victor? I was going to say that is so significant, and the reason it is so significant is because God tells Israel that the land that I have given you is my character. Yeah. It is me. Treasure it. Showcase it to the other nations. Prosper from it because it's me. Yeah. So this is, is very significant. It is. Yeah, it is. 
and they're still fighting over that land to this day. Right. Mm -hmm. um, and so it says, it's polluted and it shall destroy you. This clause, it shall destroy you, is it's obscure in Hebrew. It is either the land that destroys by casting out its inhabitants or the uncleanliness that destroys those polluted with it. Um, Prophets and Kings um, in 319 to 320 says, the call to repentance was sounded with unmistakable clearness and all were invited to return. Seek ye the Lord while he may be found, the prophet pleaded. Call ye upon him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts and let him return to the Lord. He will have mercy upon him and to our God for he will abundantly pardon so that's why God's reaching out to him. He's like, come back to me. Like I, you know, if you continue in what you're doing, this is what is going to happen, right? So come back to me. So it's, uh, she goes on to read, have you, reader, chosen your own way? Have you wandered far from God? Have you sought the feast upon the fruits of transgression only to find that them turn to ashes upon your lips? And now your life plans thwarted and your hopes dead, do you sit alone and desolate? That voice which has long been speaking to the heart, but to which you would not listen, comes to you distinct and clear. Arise ye and depart, for this is not your rest. It is polluted, it shall destroy you, even with a sore destruction. Return to your father's house, he invites you, saying, return to me, for I have redeemed thee. Come unto me, here, and your soul shall live, and I will make an everlasting covenant with you, even the sure mercies of David. Isaiah 44. Yeah, beautiful, isn't it? <clears throat> so then in verse 11, he continues, if a man walking in the spirit, so it says, if a man, because of their iniquities, the sinners among God's people did not like those who rebuked and condemned their transgressions. Those who winked at evil took an attitude of easy indifference towards sin and prophesied pleasing lies were the popular prophets. It's a bunch of verses there you can go look at. Um, Jeremiah 14, 13, 14 is an example, and it says, there, Then said I, Ah, O Lord God, behold, the prophets say unto them, Ye shall not see the sword, neither shall ye see famine, but I will give you assured peace in this place. Then the Lord said unto me, The prophets prophesy lies in my name. I sent them not, neither have I commanded them, neither spake unto them. They prophesy unto you a false vision and divination and a thing of naught and the deceit of their heart. Um, and then... Um, so the word spirit there, if a man walking in the spirit and falsehood do lie, says the Hebrew root is rach, signifying wind, hence the translation, if a man should go about and utter wind and lies. And, um, and says, I will prophesy. There is nothing that so misleads trusting souls as clothing false teachings in the apparel of God's word. Amen. You know, it's really interesting. I was listening to... The three ABN um, study for this week for the Sabbath School quarterly, and um, you know, one of, one of the the pastors Rafferty was was talking about like, you know, reading this one verse and how like from one translation to another how it changed, you know, coming coming to it to the point where it went from. I think it was the verse about being in the Lord, in, you know, for, for John when, when he was in, um, in, the in, in the Lord's day, right, in vision. Um, and some of the more modern translations after the year 2000, they actually go and say Sunday. Well, I was in Sunday, right? And so he was showing how the modern translations have started to do exactly what God told them not to do was just change anything in the word, right? And so it's just like you have to be very careful. And this started from 2000 forward in those translations. That easily can be deceived, you know? Yeah. We can easily get deceived. That's right. And, and doubt. That's know? right. Which but, one is correct? In the future, yeah. imagine that uh, new generation. How do you know, especially when people don't read the Bible in our time? Yeah. Um, also, one of the things, 
when it said about you know changing God's word, you think why does Jesus vomit out the Laodicean church? Yeah, because yeah. they're lukewarm. That's right. They wish they were either cold, they didn't say anything about him, or they were hot, and they said everything correct. Yeah, that mixture, that false sense of salvation that leads to death. Yeah, is why he vomits them out. That's right. Yeah. Also, what was that? Uh, the, this is very easy. When I read that early writing, I think Ellen White says, and then she shows a lot of the believer, the sanctifier, is falling down because they lost the, they lose the life, mm. they miss the life. Yeah, they don't have the life, and they yeah. will stumble. Yeah, I mean, imagine that the, uh, uh, is that ten virgin woman? Mm -hmm. yeah. There is very slightly difference between the five and the other five. Yeah, they five, five were were so they were all sleeping, but five had taken more oil. Yeah. Right. So, which means that they had they had spent the time saturating their minds with the Word of God versus doing whatever else distracted them. They all had oils to some extent, but some had the the amount that was needed. Right. They were all baptized. That's right. They all belong to the same church. Yep. And they all the worship the same and, God. And they were all waiting, and then they're all waiting for the bridegroom. And, they the and actually, in a sermon one time, it was placed, just said, some of them had the Holy Spirit upon them, the foolish ones. The wise ones had the Holy Spirit in them. Yeah. But that's... Yeah, it's that's, like, you know, is the Holy Spirit in you? Yeah. Or yeah, you that's or? right. And that was, that was another thing... You know that was in the lesson this week too. In the, when they were talking about the reformers, how Ellen White writes that they they saturated their minds with scripture, Amen. saturated their minds. Like you know, have we have we studied that much that we've saturated our minds with scripture? You know, um, th and and that's what's needed in order to stand yep. through the end of time, yep. right? It really is. Yep. Um, okay, so let's let's move on. We have like nine minutes left. Um, so it says here, um, it says, I will prophesy unto you of wine and strong drink. So I will prophesy, there's nothing, oh, I read that one. Um, let me, let's go on and read Matthew 7, 15. Beware of false prophets which come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravening wolves, yeah. right? So the Bible tells us, like, test all things against the Bible, right? the law and the prophets, if they not, don't speak of any of these things, there's no, there's no truth in them. So wine, the spurious seers were promising material prosperity and sexual, sensual pleasures. And so, so it is at the end of time, Revelation 17, 4, the woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet and gold and decked with gold and precious stones and pearls, having a golden cup in her hand full of abominations and filthiness of her fornication. Right, so it's all the false doctrines in the cup of... of um, the, the, the false woman at the end of time. Okay, so we're going to skip the question and, and finish up this chapter. Um, let's go to Micah 2, 12, and 13. This actually, end, the chapter really ends on a good note, so it'll help our evening to end on a good night, note. Um, who wants to read 12 and 13 for me, please? Yeah. Okay, go ahead. Okay. I will surely assemble of Jacob, all of thee. I will surely gather the remnant of Israel. I will put them together as the sheep of Bezra, as the flock in the midst of their fold. They shall make great noise by reason of the multitude of man. Verse 13 says, The breaker is come up before them. They have broken up and have passed through the gate and are gone out by it, and their king shall pass before them, and the Lord on the head of them. Okay, Ooh, amen. Beautiful picture. Yeah, absolutely. So it, it says there, I will surely assemble. So that means Micah turns his attention from the majority of the people who have gone the way of evil to the minority or the remnant who will enter into the promise of restoration and deliverance after the captivity Thus Micah denied the repeated charge of the false prophets that he was an incurable foreteller of gloom and distress. He affirmed with long-range prophetic optimism that there would be, after the exile, a future of joy and gladness for those who serve the Lord. 
So, you know, think about it, too, is, you know, in, in all these cities, you know, that, that this prophecy was being heard, you know, there, there were some true people, still true believers and still true, you know, followers of, of God in there. So can you imagine them hearing this doom coming and knowing that, you know, whatever God says, eventually it's going to come about, and re, regardless of whether or not they're true followers or not, they would be swept into it. So how disheartening could that be if, there had, if God had not given them a message in here too to say, I will return you? Go ahead, Byron. Um, mm -hmm. The uh, Syrian, um, mm -hmm. he had the Jewish slave girl. When he yeah, had leprosy, right, she right. said, I know of a prophet. That's right. One right. dare to believe that she actually was a true believer. That's right. Absolutely. So they were there. They were, absolutely. And, and we know Daniel and the, the That's right. authorities that were taken to Babylon. Yep. Based on the Micah prophecy, they yep. probably were alive at that time. Yep. Enough message to not to be like that, not to be like that. We get enough. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. yes, we do. Everyone does. God, God gives everybody enough knowledge to make a decision for sure. Right. I mean, it's just like. Yeah. 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 Okay. So it says, um, and then going back to twelve. Oh Jacob, all of thee. Um, that is, all of the remnant, although God would have all his professed people be saved, only the few, the remnant, who sincerely turn from their sins and walk in the ways of righteousness will be saved. By God's grace, many are called, but because of the perverse iniquity of the human heart, unfortunately, few are chosen. Matthew twenty two fourteen says, For many are called, but few are chosen. And Revelation 14, 12 says, here is the patience of the saints. Here are those who keep the commandments of God in the faith of Jesus. So he ends by saying there, um, they shall make a great noise by reason of the multitude. So great noise shows that the remnant would be a great multitude. Hallelujah. Um, and then verse 13, the breaker is come up before them. So breaker is from the Hebrew paros, or to make a breach, to break through. The parallelism of the verse points to Jehovah here, shown breaking down all opposition before his people. Broken up is better translated broken through. The captives follow their leader. Their passing through the gates shows their removal from the land of their exile. And their king that shall pass before them. Their king is the same Lord that led his people out of Egyptian bondage and later delivered them from captivity. Will in the near future free the redeemed from the bondage and captivity of this world's sin. Deuteronomy 31.8 says, And the Lord, he it is that doth go before thee. He will be with thee. He will not fail thee, neither forsake thee. Fear not neither be dismayed. Isaiah 45, 2 says, I will go before thee and make the crooked place straight. I will break in pieces the gates of brass and cut in sunder the bars of iron. Romans 8, 31 says, What shall we then say to these things? If God be for us, who can be against us? He that spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? And John 14, 2 and 3 says, In my Father's house are many mansions, and if it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you, and if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there ye may be also. Christ's Object Lessons 206.3 says, He will bring you into his banqueting house, and his banner over you shall be love. That came from Song of Solomon. If thou wilt walk in my ways, he declares, I will give thee places to walk among these that stand by, even among the holy angels that surround his throne. What a, yeah. What a promise. Yeah. Yeah. So as in any age where God's judgment has befallen the wicked, while God's faithful may not be spared the trial, for the remnant of the upright there will be restoration. Yeah. Study plain revelation. It talks about the remnant, the 144,000 that are yeah. alive when Christ comes. 
was a great multitude. Yes, the that's about right. The entire remnant, their voice together almost sounds like thunder. Yep. And it's almost reminiscent of like the voice of God, obviously much lesser, but still, yeah. it's like, it's that many. So when you consider the billions and billions of people, yeah. Yeah. okay, it's a smaller remnant, but heaven's not going to be so sparse. Seems no, exactly right. that's right. It'll, it'll be beautiful. Okay. All right. Any final thoughts, questions for the evening? I must say I really like my God so far. Yeah. Yeah, I do too. If only we can learn yeah. from I the agree. experience of our four I, I agree. I, I, I myself think of that all the time. I'm just like, Lord, you know, there's, there's things in my life I need to straighten out. Like, you know, it's just like some things are just so hard day to day. And you're just like, some days you wonder, am I ever going to make it? But the promises are there. Yep. So if we stay the course and, you know, he just says, come to me, repent and come to me. And isn't that what it's about? Yep. Recognizing how, um, how, how weak and sinful we are and recognizing our need for him. Yeah. There's the key to the successful of Jesus during his time in, in this earth is prayer. Yeah, that's right. He's connected that's right. to the Father. That's right. And the Holy Spirit nurture him and the angels, that's right. you know, helping him before anything. You know, it's the Holy Spirit that pointing to him everything yeah. he answers. I think we need to be sensitive to those people who are around us in our communities too, who are not of our faith. That's right. Absolutely. And be, be willing to reach out to them. Yep. I mean, I was, yep. I, I'm just amazed. I'm amazed sometimes that the Holy Spirit does what the Holy Spirit yep. does with people. I, I completely 100% agree. Yep. Yeah. But God, God is always at work. Yep. All right. Well, let's, let's uh, pray and close for the evening. And uh, don't forget to come back next week for the second part of Micah. All right. Dear Father in heaven, I thank you, Lord, that we've had this opportunity to study this important book, this message that you, you have left us. Lord, it's, it's not an oversight on your part that something that was written for ancient Israel is still to be read and learned and, and studied today's time, because in, indeed there's much significance. Lord, um, as you've said in, in your word, there's... Um, you know, even though ultimately you will bring destruction for evil must expire completely, Lord. We know that. But you will always have a remnant. So we pray that we humbly will accept that invitation. Amen. That we will also be um, the expositors of that for others. That we might, we might engender uh, them to you um, through you know, our character, the way we act, the, the, our words, our testimony, that um, others may come to see you and us, that they would desire um, what, what we have because it's only in you that there's true peace. So thank you, Lord, for being with us this evening. Go with each one of us as we go into the Sabbath hours and uh, bless us with your presence. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you so much.